good evening to all of you. Dr. Arkat Ramchandran, Chairman, Governing Council of TV. Dr. Master Chatterjee, Director General of the Institute of Corporate Affairs. Dr. R.K. Patoli, Director General of Thiri, members of the faculty of the university, distinguished members of Thiri, brothers and sisters. I'm quite excited to participate in this meet, which is called the 11th Darbari said memorial lecture. Mr. Sith was a remarkable leader of business, a human being with outstanding values and qualities and a citizen of India who always kept in focus the good of the country. He was a great patriot, an innovator with courage of conviction and a, and a belief in himself which made him one of the greatest business leaders of our time. We have also chosen to, you know, the present mementos to 20 colleagues who have completed 20 years and also <coughs> felicitated the winners of Terry Roll of Honor 2011. I think this all very exciting and interesting. Maybe that in our government also I think we need to do something you know, because ultimately the, these are the days you know you perform or you perish. This is what you know the milestone one has to you know one has to put in the optimum level of performance. And I was told that he has not ranked them. This is what that architecture told me that you know all of them have been you know those people who are researchers and also who have been in the faculties have been awarded this. This is how you know we need to award people who work. But many a time, you know, we always, you know, we take everybody on an average. I was a, a small minister in Karnataka some time back. And I was a young enthusiastic young minister. Then I had a lot of ambitious plan. Then I asked my then chief secretary, you know, get me one officer who is dynamic who has a lot of animal spirit and you know who can you know who can perform. But he said every any officer will do so for this purpose. <laughs> this is how you know the we have a sense of average. That's how you know sometimes you know the people who really have that zeal, enthusiasm to perform, you know, they will not be doing it. You know the it so happened that you know the even as a manage, minister, so you have to work with some, with a, within a Lakshman Rekha. You know, one, one day I told my chief minister at that time, in the 70s, I want to acquire 25,000 acres of land. He said, wait. I said, you know, the, I want to establish an electronic city. I said, foolish, you know, the 25,000 acres, we have don't have money in the government. Then there were some good innovative bankers. They said, we will give you the money. They gave me the money. Then I asked for an IAS officer to, you know, to become the CMD of that electronic corporation. Again, we don't have IAS officers to be given at the foolish and beset to each other. Then ultimately I had to get my friend who was working in VL as a CMD. Result of that idea is today. My idea was the most to make it a Silicon Valley, alternate Silicon Valley of the of the Asia. Now I think it has exceeded, Bangalore has exceeded Silicon Valley. <laughs> this is how we have been actually, you know, these are the days, you know, it is not only to have the dreams, the vision, or the innovation, I think. These are the days when we have to, you know, break through. That's how the India can be built. That's why I appreciate that Dr. Pachuri for having worked this kind of a scheme of uh, putting the best performance in the role of honor and you know honor them on the occasion like this. I think this is a good example, exemplary act which is done by you. I think I think rest of the PSUs and also I think 
some of the research institute and also our government, government should also do it. Like many of these things I incorporated with my administrative reform commission. And uh, of course, again, the, some people think that you know all these reforms I suggested, they are little far beyond our thinking and far beyond the circumstances and I think it takes its own time to implement. I'm very happy today that you know the, the you have chosen the right person for the job, uh, Dr. Pascal Chatterjee, to deliver particularly a subject like sustainable futures, imperatives for managing the social agenda. It's an excellent subject, topic of the day and tomorrow. Ultimately, this is sustainability is one, one character for a society, for a civilization. We always, you know, the you know, Arnold Bombay once said that, you know, he identified 21 world, world civilization. And he said, out of 21 world civilization, 19 such civilization perished, not because of external aggression, but because of the crisis in character of the, in the respective civilization. I rather feel that, you know, this is the character. Sustainable is the character what needs to cherish, otherwise, as you all have said, you know, what happened and what was predicted by Arnold Tonpa, you know, ultimately the, the, the crisis of this kind of character of sustainability, you know, will definitely make a country to perish, a civilization to perish, and mankind <coughs> will be the worst sufferers of that. That's why today, you know, we have also, I think, one or two seminars we also conducted on the sustainability, and I think we are working on the formula for sustainable reporting for all the corporate bodies. I think it is shortly is being finalized and we are coming out, corporate affairs ministry will come out with that. The country is predicted to be a strong, you know, country with economy for a future for the Indian economy by passing even China by 2050. There may be some temporary setbacks. Maybe that is how the, some of the agencies have made negative observations regarding outlook for the economy of the country. There could be many in what they are saying, but the positive economic indicators are equally meritorious. Therefore, there is a need to take a balanced view in this country. There is a wider consensus on the fact that the fundamentals of the Indian economy are strong enough to face some of the challenges you see around. And in fact, you know, the annual growth, even the Prime Minister said, you know, present annual growth rate of 6.5 may not be that unreasonable given the overall international scenario and that the steps are underway and the country would soon recover to a growth rate of 8 to 9 percent. When we say that the fundamentals of our economy is strong, you no, all we know that this assessment is based on sound statistics and data, not imaginary. The Indian economy has registered an average GDP growth of around 7.7% in, in the last nine years. Per capita net national product has nearly doubled. India's forex reserves have risen nearly six times from US $54 dollars, mid billion dollars to nearly just $304.5 billion. The saving rate has increased from 24.9% to 32.3%, indicating higher wealth creation by households. Private corporate savings rate increased from merely 3.3% to approximately 8%. India's share in global exports have also increased from 0.7% in 2001 to 1.5% in 2010. And in even the key social indicators, for example, literacy rate, which has improved from 65% to 74% last nine years. And the NSO survey also shows that between 2005-2010, 18 million job opportunities were all over the world, particularly in the US and European countries. The steep job losses, you know, we could definitely maintain this. That's how, you know, just, uh, I'm just bringing it to your notice because, you know, the, our country, you know, with the kind of 
progress and the growth that we, are, we can sustain. For example, investment report of 2012 released by UNTAT. On 5th July 2012, India is positioned as the third most preferred FDI destination. With all the travails of the, you know, the reports which are coming out. In fact, you know, next to China and United States, this is a definite indication that India's long-term growth story is intact. The World Bank in its global economic prospects released in early June 2012 as projected India will see growth measured at factor cost increasing to 6.9, 7.2 and 7.4 percent in fiscal year 2012-13, 13-14 and 2014-15 respectively. Even Ernest Young, you know, they said doing business in India 2012, overseas investment in Asia's third largest economy rose for the first time three years in 2011 as global investors put their faith in this country. I don't want to narrate more things on that. It is just to show that it only, we need to meet with these challenges of growth in this country. An explosive growth which can take place. And that you know the India, India will be the youngest country you know, by another 15, 25, 30 years in an average 29 years of working population. And you know, while you know, growth has to be looked after, growth has to be sustained, you know, we need to sustain the growth with sustainability of the environment. And unless the place is comfortable and you know, safe to live in, you know, any kind of a growth will not help. Growth has to be horizontal. Growth has to be, has to have a inclusive totally on social point of view, it is also inclusive with regard to the geographical point of view and this is what we need to do it and we need to carry it and we cannot afford to face any disaster at any point of time, at a time we are in a series of growth. Business and industries have to play a very proactive role in ensuring sustainable and equitable growth. As the challenges of the world should not and cannot be borne by governments, and nations alone. The responsibility to change this world for the better, to bridge the gap between the haves and have nots, to ensure that communities can continue to regenerate, lie in each other, and every one of us as a global citizen. I know that global economy should have a global citizenship, otherwise it's meaningless. And that includes especially business with the resources which can be channeled into a diverse array of programs to address these challenges and work together with the communities they operate in to bring up a sustainable future for all. And that's what I explained as a, according to me, sustainability is the national character which we should very properly, you know, uh, the sustain and not just challenge. In fact, India's ancient wisdom, which is still relevant today, inspires people to work for the larger objective of the well-being of our stakeholders. That's the principle with which we need to, you know, not to look ourselves, not to look our own country. You know, when you think of sustainability, the environment, I think you, need, you think of the entire globe, not your home, your community, your nation. This is how that universal brotherhood, universal approach has always been the motto of Indian mentality and Indian psyche. While a lot of human and economic energy is available for utilization in this area, a suitable mechanism is required to channelize this energy for which the government, corporate sector and the communities need to partner together. The subject of corporate social responsibility is one thing which, you know, the, in the new company bill which is being finalized. Now we, we each corporate entity with certain level of profits for past for three consecutive years need to shall spend you know two percent of their profit. And of course Mr. Marka Chatterjee has done a very pioneering job as secretary of the public uh, enterprises and you know during his regime he said the 
spending on the public sector, he made it compulsory and you know, to the extent of 3%. That was a great plan in the market. That means to say, more than any private corporate, the government, the PSUs, they took the pioneer report. This very rarely happens. In fact, you know, I think now the the corporates, private corporates will have to chase the public enterprise. This is how it is happening and he is responsible for that. That's why he is the right person for this occasion. In fact, I am also interested in the responsibility of you know you all doing that kind of a sustainable reporting, which has to be again mandated as far as every corporate body is concerned. And you know that is what we are working out with the help of Terry and also particularly Dr. Pachori will be in a position to make a good beginning on that. Failure of environmental stability poses an even greater danger of the world in the long run, more than a war. A decade ago, concern about the environment globally was limited mostly to environmental advocacy groups and experts. Today it is almost universal. Unless we lessen environmental damage, concern on our use of energy and other natural resources and attempt to slow attempt to slow global warming disaster lies ahead. Global warming has become a true challenge of globalization. In fact I dealt with this subject also with the due consultation with Dr. K. Pachori in one of my uh, one of my uh, administrative reforms report called uh, disaster management. I dealt with in greater detail on that. Successes of development, especially in India and China, have provided those countries the economic wherewithal to increase energy usage. But the world's environment simply cannot sustain such an onslaught. There will be great problems ahead if everybody emits greenhouse gases at the rate at which Americans have been doing so. The good news is that this is by now almost universally recognized, except in some quarters in Washington but the adjustments in lifestyles will not be as easy. Human population is currently growing at a rate that makes sustaining for resources impossible. The world simply cannot continue consuming at a rise, rising rate while resources begin to fall. Because at some point there will be no resources left to consume. Future will be in jeopardy. We don't think of that future generation. Our existence on Earth cannot have a continued negative impact on the environment, which we depend on our food and resources. Sustainability seeks to use less resources or restore those that we have used. Around the globe, people and industries are increasingly realizing and progressing towards the relevance of it. I must tell you that now, actually, people are realizing it. I think the days of it, we have graduated ourselves from the advocacy to, you know, in fact, the, the core, core sustainable theory and in practice. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, WWF's Living Planet Report and countless other publications testify to the massive and urgent need for change. However, human society has great inertia. Even getting people to recognize a problem, let alone agree on a course of action, can be an escalating process, although some caution is war warranted. When it comes to major force corrections, exponential chain, feedback loops and tipping points mean that we have a limited window of time in which to react effectively. As a simplification, we can imagine creative solutions being given from the bottom up or from top top. The bottom line is that our environmental and social problems require radical solutions deployed on a massive scale part on a pilot basis. Einstein's oft-cited maxim that, I quote, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Has perhaps never been true than it is for sustainability. We need big C, eminent creativity and creative destruction. We need evolution or rather breakthrough, not just innovation. No up to that state. As a concept, sustainability has captured our imaginations and aspirations. As a tangible and identifiable goal, it eludes us. Having developed indicators to measure and monitor economic, social 
and environmental conditions we want now to measure sustainably. Should be measured. Our em emphasis on physical, the objective, and the rational controversy is only the external manifestation of sustainability. The internal manifestations of sustainability, the non material, the subjective, and the experimental are put to one side since they are messy, interpretive, and time consuming. The world of harmonities. Sustainability, however, is more than a thing to be measured since it is about ecological integrity, quality of life, and transformation of transcendence. As regards the Ministry of Corporate, we are already taken steps you know, part on this and we will be very serious about it. Regarding my new assignment, the Ministry of Power, we, as we know, with the liberalization of the Indian economy, the role of the corporate sector has responded greatly such that large number of activities that were part of the commanding heights of the environment are now open to the participation of the private sector. This is indeed true of the power sector where private players are now playing an extremely important, I think from the 70 percent, you know, in the 10th plan, the 11th plan it has come to 57 percent participation by the private sector. And you know, maybe that, you know, the 12th plan, you know, it may exceed even 75 percent of the contribution in the power sector. You can just imagine the kind of challenges we have, I think, as and when, of course, private sector, they need to understand their social responsibility and understand their unique role to ensure that, you know, the sustainability it should be not only the mere rhetoric, you know, it has to be part of their life. This is what we need to do it, and that is what we are working on. Power generation distribution, both in our regulation of business activities, so that by virtue of becoming a natural monopoly, Private corporate corp operators are regulated, making profits which are within acceptable limits, such that these are not an irrational or unhealthy level. It is with this in view, a regulatory framework has been developed, both at the centre and the states, by establishing Central Electricity Regulatory Commission. I have convened a meeting of all the chairmen of the state regulatory commissions, you know, the 29th of this month. Maybe that this is one of the subjects which I go to discuss and we we'll formulate certain set formulas, you know, to ensure that, you know, the, in, you know, they should not think of only, you know, increasing tariff or rationalizing tariff, but I think sustainability should be an important agenda in the regulatory process. And this is what we need, I will be, uh, you know, I will be discussing with that Rathi for a solution even before 29, so that I can, when I meet all the chairmen of the regulatory bodies, I may be in a position formulate certain, uh, certain uh, you know, the rationale or some strategy so that we can pronounce it. However, this is a country with the limited fossil fuel resources and therefore we have come up with the approach by which we optimize the use of fossil fuels, move rapidly towards sustainable resources of energy such as nuclear, wind, solar, biomass and even geothermal and ocean based energy for this purpose. It is important for the power sector to set up research capacity and that would help not only to map out a sustainable future but also assist all the power sector organizations in the country with intellectual inputs to help them meet the goals of society and their own business interests. A good example of the kind, institution, the kind of institution that we should develop in this country is the Electric Power Research Institute in the US which has developed a high level of professional expertise and close linkages with energy sector industries across the country. We need a similar organization in India as well. I am contemplating such initiative with the Ministry of Power in near future. As I said, in a general sense, quite apart from checks and balances and regulatory measures that the government or society establishes, business also has to be guided by ethical standards that are essential not only for society's well-being, but for the sustainability of business enterprises themselves. Mr. Darbar is his example as a great leader of the business, who always kept in focus the interest of the society, is one that leaders of the corporate sector must emulate. It has been said that business cannot succeed in a society which fails. You cannot, you know, you cannot have a successful business when the society fails. You can't do that. There is therefore a mutual interdependence between business and society which corporate leaders should 
fully understand. It must also be remembered that we are living in times when public scrutiny of all enterprises, including government, is at an all-time high. This is a awakened citizenship, citizen in the country over. A business enterprise that does not afford high ethical standards is bound to suffer major reputational loss which will ultimately affect its own business status. Reputation is very important. Somewhere in, I read that you know, the success, success of an enterprise or a corporate body depends upon 75%, you know, depends upon 75% of reputation. You know, this is how, you know, the, now you know, see, this is what we say ethical high standard, which has to be maintained. It is noteworthy that theory organizes, organizes the Darbari Shet Memorial Lecture annually, which is not only an important symbolic tribute to Mr. Darbari Shet, but also a platform which an important message can be spread to Indian society on changes and actions that are required for the welfare of the people of this country. So I am very happy that you know, I could associate with that. Sorry, there will be a keynote address only by Dr. Bhaskar Chatterjee. I have not wondered that. It's only an introductory to his keynote address. With this, I thank the organizers, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Arka Ramchandran, Dr. Arke Pachodhi, for thinking of me to come and you know, preside over this great thing. Thank you very much. All of you.